But here's what happened as a result of that. There we go. Now they can even hear online, which is so much better. So good morning to all of those online. Um, you can join us now, which is fantastic. But May at uni is just one of these crazy times. Now, what is it about it that makes it so crazy? The thing that makes it so crazy is that it's the crunch. Everything sort of comes together, concatenates together, and in that moment, the pressure is on. Pressure to perform, pressure for staff, pressure for students. It's just everything about the semester is coming to an end because all of the learning is about to be assessed, either in exams or in the final assessment tasks that are handed in. And so pressure is on, and so people aren't turning up to class, they're stressed, they're, they're getting le less sleep. And as a result of that, I, I teach uh, a very interesting subject. It's one of, it's, well, actually, it's my favorite subject. It's biblical spirituality. And in that class, at the beginning of the semester, I get the students to, to sort of set their targets for spiritually, how would they like to grow this semester? And so they do that. And then at the end of the semester, I, I kind of cheekily say, so how'd it go? You know, when you hit Mad May, how was it? When, when the pressure was on, what happened to your spiritual life? Did, did, you, did you dig deeper? Did you go deeper with God or did you get a little flaky? And Mad Manical May does things to people. Now, of course, you don't have Mad Manical May. You just have life right? And life has its own ups and downs. It has its own twists and turns. And, and sin can actually crush the life out of us if we're not careful. Like it can squeeze the last bit of juice out. And, and, and the next thing you know, you could be doing three weeks in Papua New Guinea like Cynthia and I and all the crew and discover that in the busyness of that, I was running on fumes. It's just like, wow, life just got so busy. It's just like, wow, how does it get busy? And then I come back and I thought that was busy and now this is insane, right? And it's just like it's ramped up and you know what it's like. Cynthia's had a big week and I just joke and say, well, I'm having a big life. If you got your Bible there, I want you to open it up. We're going to one of the Psalms today and the Psalm we're going to is Psalm 63. And here I think... Um, is an example of the kinds of pressures that come in life. And here, the, the big idea from today's message that I want you to wrestle with is how do we live our life in those pressure point moments? And, and how do we continue journeying with God through those moments so that we don't actually get flaky, we don't fall apart, we don't sort of lose the plot, but we actually stay true to God. So here it is, Psalm 63, starting there um, with the preamble, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Oh, that says a lot to us. Wilderness, right? Yeah, that can sneak up on you. Oh God, you're my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts you, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise you with my joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it should go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king, the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. There we go. Lord, as we open your word and as we meditate on its words today, just speak to us from it, we pray. Amen. Amen. You see, David knew about being thirsty. And he was in a wilderness. Now, let, now let's unpack this wilderness a little bit. He, he had multiple times in his life where, where things went a little haywire and he was under the pump and being pressured in so many different respects. And this was one of those occasions where, where and we're not sure whether it was Saul who was chasing him into the wilderness or whether it was Absalom, his son, chasing him into the wilderness. But the result is the same. He's in the wilderness. And the wilderness is a strange place. I don't know whether you know what it is to thirst. 
But thirst is a peculiar thing. It, 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 it's to start with, you just don't really notice it sneaking up, but it does gradually. It sneaks up. And, and when it sneaks up, it's, you, you notice there's a dryness to the mouth and the tongue starts to feel a little bit funny. And, and as a result of that, it's kind of like, ah, oh, hmm, what's, ah, oh, I'm thirsty. That's what it is. And, you know, after working a hot day in the sun, I can be really consciously aware that, oh, wow, I haven't drunk much today. I'm really thirsty. And, and, and then so all that night, I'm just kind of filling up the tank again because I've been empty all day. don't know if you've sort of had that experience. But thirst can actually be even far more serious than that. It's like, what if the, there is no water? What if you're driving in the car all day and you ran out of water in the morning and you're still driving the car in the afternoon and, and now you just, you, the, 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 the parchedness in the mouth actually takes on a different stage. It, it now goes to where your saliva starts to get really thick and dodgy kind of and, and now it, it's forming sort of stickles around the mouth and, and it's really interesting. The thirst starts to really change and transform because there's this thirst and it's really easy in the thirst to think about the pity. Oh, why am I in this flaming desert? What's, yeah, pardon the French. Um, what's going wrong? You know, it's like, how did I actually come to be in this hard place? And in a culture that wants to, to parade the victims as being heroes, it's really easy for David in this moment. It would have been so easy for him to go, ha, huh, wow, look, yeah, it's because of these mad people chasing me. And, and he could have descended into a little pity party is what he could have done. And he could have actually had crowds of people around. Oh, David, I know. It's just so terrible when your son chases you. Oh, it's just so terrible when the king is just trying to throw his sword at you. And, and so it would be really easy to descend into that kind of moment. But I love what David does here. I love what he does. Because look at it. He, it the Bible says that, that he starts. He says, oh God. Now, we need, to, we need to understand a thing about the way that Hebrews used to think. They dare not say the name of God. They, they got to the point in their, their journey with God that they decided that saying the name of God was not something you would do. So if you were going to say the name of God, you inserted something else in there. You might throw in Adonai or Elohim. So, so it's, it's thought here that, that at the start of this where it goes, oh God, you're my God. It's kind of like, well, what's he really saying? He's really saying, not just, oh, Elohim, you're my El, that's the Hebrew. He's actually saying, oh, Yahweh. Yahweh, the, the personal name for God, the God who's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of the living, not the dead, the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who comes into the midst of a desert with you and knows what you're going through. And so here at the start of this psalm, instead of descending into a lament, instead of descending into, a, into an Eeyore kind of moment, you know what Eeyore does? It's, oh, life would be good if it wasn't so bad. You know, and instead of that kind of moment, what's he doing instead? He's like, oh, God, Elohim, Yahweh, you are my God. And I love that. I love the way he's approaching this. He's, he's not, you know... In terms of psychology, we can, we can actually describe it this way. It's so easy in relationships between a husband and a wife for, for one of them to have what's called negative sentiment override, NSO. It's like a cruise line, you know, you, you, you jump on the cruise and you're going to be on this cruise for a while, NSO. And what is it? Negative sentiment override. And what happens is the brain can descend into this kind of moment and in this moment it starts to reevaluate your history because negative things in the relationship are built up to such an extent that your brain just goes, ah, yeah, that's right, it's rubbish now, but it's always been rubbish. Oh, yeah, all those times where she was doing these things, she was just pretending to do those things. Oh, it's just so terrible. Or, or, or she can be thinking, oh, yeah, look, he's just useless like his old man. It's just like fair dinkum. You know, and, and so at this point, all of the good times are reinterpreted as bad times 
because negative sentiment override is crushing the life out of things. Ever had that happen? Happens to lots of people in relationships if you're not careful. And the trick is that instead of letting negative sentiment override sort of kick in and take over, what's actually needed is positive sentiment override. And people think, well, is that just the power of positive thinking? No, it's so much more. It's what do you choose to focus on? David could have focused on the fact that he's in a desert, that he's in this wilderness, that he's, that he's no longer in the comforts of home, that, that all of the things that he was used to, he's had to let go of, and now he's doing life on the run. That's not easy. It's certainly no fun. And it would be so easy to let negative sentiment override when, the, when, when his generals come and they're chatting to him and saying, David, why don't you, you, you've got the opportunity, why don't you kill Saul? David, you've got the opportunity, why don't you do your son in? So easy to let the negative override. But David doesn't. It's absolutely remarkable that instead, what he doubles down on, he's in, the preamble says that, oh, he's in the wilderness. He's on the run. But his opening words is, oh God, you are my God. He's not letting his negativity take him and descending into this dark place of depression and sadness, but rather he's letting positive sentiment override kick in and he's remembering that God is still God. And he's not just any God, he's the God of the person. He's the God of the family. He's the God who sees you in the desert, sees you when you're thirsty sees you when your hunger is so gnawing away on the inside that you're, you're attempting to mask all of that with cleverness. You, you, you go to the, the games and you just game veg for hours or, or you just stream Netflix for days on end just so that you can salve your soul because you're so thirsty and you don't know what else to do. Well, David's got a different solution to that. His answer is, come, oh, come to the Father. Our Yahweh, our Elohim, He's still God. He sees where you are. He knows your pain. He knows how mad May can be. He understands how desperate your circumstances are. He gets all of that and He's right there in the midst of it with you. And here's what else He says. He says this, my soul thirsts for you. Well, actually, even the, the little bit before it, He says, early will I seek you. That's New King James. But actually, a better translation might be, earnestly I seek you. And there's something really interesting about that. When, when he's on the run, when, when the chips are down, when life is hard and you're in that barren place of hardness, what is it that we should do? And this is the conversation literally I had with my students on Thursday. Last, uh, actually on Wednesday, last day of class with them. And I'm chatting to them and saying, hey, you know, how's it gone this semester? When, when, when you were really under the pump and, and you're working and some of them were like, oh, well, let me tell you. Yeah, I, I, I didn't do my devotions in the morning. I just, I was too pressured. I had too much on and, and I needed to get that essay finished and in on time, otherwise I'm losing marks. And so, so I just said, God, you have to understand. And, and I jumped into doing the essay. Now, does God, does God keep score against us for doing that? What do you think? Yeah, no, of course he doesn't. But what does God want? Well, he wants what any person in relationship wants. He wants connection, communion, conversation, heart to heart, person to person, being to being. That's what he's after. And so when we, when we renege on that, he's kind of like, oh, I see you're a little busy. Did you know that I could help with your efficiency did you know that I could actually bring blessings into your life, that, that you've got mental clarity and greater powers, that the life that I would offer you, it bubbles up into every other area of your life. And instead of being less energetic, you'd now be more energetic because I am, after all, the God of life. And I've got something for you. But if you don't need it today, well, that's okay. I'll just hang back and... I'll just love you anyway, but I'll be loving a little distant today because you haven't made the time. David recognized the problem. 
and the love that he does. I love that he does. David's problems were his problems because of the choices he'd made earlier. The, 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 the way he'd, he'd, he'd actually destroyed a whole family because of lust and, and the way that it ruined things. He, he was paying a price for that. But he recognises the problem now. And what's the problem? The problem is a thirst. He recognises that there's this relational distance between him and God. And the problem is not with God. The problem is with him. And he needs to close that distance. So earnestly, earnestly he comes. Earnestly he opens himself up. Earnestly he, he desires to seek God. And you know, a number of years ago, I had the most glorious thing happen to me. I say that somewhat facetiously. I was, um, I was pastoring at Maitland Curry Church. I was working out in the local gym. I was feeling reasonably fit and healthy. That morning I'd been for a 2K run and that afternoon I was going to go for about a 10, 12K bike ride on the mountain bike and it was like, oh yes, Sabbath would be starting a little later on and it was just like life was sweet. So I get on the mountain bike and I'm thinking, right Neil, um, I did a 2K run this morning. I'm feeling great. I think I'm, I'll, I'll just really hit the pump. On the bike. So I took off, I sprinted up the driveway across the road, down the road, and I'm, I'm hitting pretty good speed. It was a cool day, a little bit wet and overcast, not quite as wet as this, but something like this. And I got down um, just where the start of the track around Dora Creek is, near where I live, and as I hit the track, the grass was wet. The mountain bike hit the grass. The bike slid out from under me. I crashed to the ground and instantly knew that I'd broken my collarbone. Not the sort of sound you want to hear close to your head. And I'm like, dang, you idiot. And then I realized I was only 400 meters from home, but I'd have to do the walk of shame. So I get the mountain bike and I'm on my feet, one arm, you know, clutching this shoulder now like this because oh, it's just in agony, pushing the bike and doing the walk of shame back home again. I say it was a glorious accident. I ended up in John Hunter that evening, great way to welcome Sabbath. Next day I'm under pain meds. It's beautiful, no? And then on the Monday I'm in Sydney Adventist Hospital. Newcastle, John Hunter, they just sent me home and said, oh, it'll mend. Got a second opinion from a guy in Sydney on Sabbath. He looked at the x-rays and went, yep, I'll book you in on Monday. And so I've got a steel plate in there, screws, it's great. His surgery was spot on. But in the days that followed that, how glorious they were. I'm like, well, I can't do much while I'm just actually allowing myself to mend. So in the next three days, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'll do. Uh, something that I've been meaning to do for a while. I thought, Lord, I'll just get my Bible out. I'll just start reading my Bible again. Let's get reacquainted. Neil 2.0. <laughs> so I did. I started, um, I mapped out a devotional plan to actually go deeper with God, to actually really connect with God in a whole new way. And I will say that that broken collarbone was one of the most glorious moments in my life. As a result of that moment, things began to change for me and, and change in the really the right kind of ways. And I'll, I'll share a, 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 well, actually, let me just do that even now. As a result of that, one of the things that, that came was was this um, was this poem right and so I want to I started writing poetry and and the poetry would arise from a time of Bible study and then a time of prayer but it wasn't any kind of prayer I decided that that in order to enhance my prayer life what I really needed most was to actually begin to to journal the prayers so now I started actually writing prayers out for the first time in my, well, first, I won't say first time in my life, but the first time in about 25 years, I decided, yep, I want to I wanna actually just start writing them down. The discipline of doing that would focus my mind and keep me on track. So I started doing that. But what I discovered was the, the more I actually spent just connecting with God and I, I started using a journaling app to track with accountability the, the times that I was spending. So there's a whole lot of intentionality that was going with that. 
was that I discovered often at the end of that, I would actually just start writing poetry. And here's one of those poems I'd like to share with you today. It's called The Blind Man. It's got a French word in there. I think I might still use the French word because um, it adds something about the authenticity of this. And it was written on the, um, on the 18th of May in 2020, so not that long ago. Damn, it's so dark. I cannot see who turned out the light. Oh, where's that damn torch when I need it? Who left that there? What is it anyway? A wall? A fence? A well? All of my own device. And kill a man they will. So stupid. Cliffs taunting near the edge of the path. Fog. Oh, such dense fog covers my mind. Where's that flame and torch? I stumble and fall. Not again. Tripping on my blind self-importance, circling back, always back to the same important question. Where's my blooming torch? If only I could see. I can do this. Behold the darkness. Taking care of number one, creeps in and slinkers down to the depths of my soul, cold and heartless, obsessed with self. God helps those who help themselves, you know, and and I do, denying the need of my brother. Well, he can take care of himself, can't he? Unable to see the desperation. Oh, if only I could see they were all in the same, all in the same boat, on the same train, caught in this moment together, hopeless, blind, and yes, even naked. I have no torch, it's broken. My torch is broken. Okay, yes, look, I get it. I understand it's not just my torch. I'm broken as well. Behold, the light piercing the darkness, drawing near, illuminates us. Oh, ah, ah, that's what I tripped on, arrogance. Oh, and that too, self-righteousness. Yeah, that one gets me all the time, I know. Ah, that light is closer now. The real cliffhanger, my pride and stubborn independence. Oh, oh, what, what's that? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but it's my favourite, Lord, it's my favourite. Oh, you want it now? Are you sure? I must let it go? No, 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 I don't want the darkness again. Okay, okay, you can have it. Take all of it. Behold the light. So many colours. Glorious, radiant. And deeply satisfying. Oh Lord, tis you. You are the light. You are the gift that lights the way. Oh Lord, you are the way. You are the answers to my questions. Oh Lord, you are the truth. You are the light that brings the dance and song. Oh Lord, you are the life. I get it now slowly. Oh, so slowly at first. Fog had to lift, mind had to clear, self had to die, eyes had to adjust to the colour and brightness, feet had to get used to walking in the way, and my mind had to trust the voice of truth, and my heart, oh yes, my heart has to learn to dance and sing in step with the life of lives. T'was blind, but now, now I see a little better. You see, the problem was, so for so much of my Christian life, you know, Michelle Van Loon describes it this way, and I've got to hurry. She says that there's stages in the Christian life. The first stage is just awareness of God. The second stage is is being a disciple and, and making a decision to follow Jesus. The third stage, oh, that's the glorious stage for the church. It's where you get involved in your church and you're highly productive and the church loves you because you're doing things. And the problem with that is that, that so often that's where the church will grow you to just this point and that's where the church is most happy because you're contributing to the greater good of the church and, and its mission and purpose. But it's actually, there's more. And what we don't often talk about as a church is how do we get to the more? Where is the more? What helps me grow beyond just being someone who's giving of themselves but not always for the right reasons because maybe it started out as the right reasons but in the end it's like, oh, look at me. I'm up front. 
Why, why you've got to re-elect me as elder. If you don't re-elect me as elder, well, what will I do? Well, I'll, I'll stop attending church now because being elder is all about me. And you will have met people like that. I have as pastor. And I've met pastors who are like, well, well, if, well, well, I couldn't possibly sleep in a bunk bed because I'm too important for that. I, 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 need a, I need a room with a cabin and toilet and shower and an ensuite. And yet Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. It's like, how do we get to this point that, that we live the Christian life and it's about, well, it's about me. Jesus said this. He said, without me, you can do Nothing, oh yeah, but I don't really believe that. The students that I was talking with this week didn't believe that either. They were thinking that, well, look, Lord, yeah, I know, you're just the optional extra. You're just something I choose when I've got the time. But when life is really busy, I, I have no time for you, Lord, because right now what I need, I need to do. See, notice the language, I need to do this. Oh, and I know it's just my students. It's not you. You don't have that problem. When you're in the desert and you're thirsty and you're looking for somewhere to go, you are naturally doing what David did, turning to the Lord, yeah? Oh, if only we knew and remembered that. So here I was at stage three of my life. And, and, and there's this thing that, that writers talk about. They call it the dark night of the soul sometimes, or they call it the wall, or whatever it is. It, it's this moment that God confronts us. And he confronts us with the existential question, which is, Neil, are you enough? Well, the answer to that question is always, no, I'm not. That's my problem. I'm not enough. And he's like, yeah, I thought so. So what are you going to do? You're going to keep thinking that, that you can bluff your way through life and bluff your way being a pastor and bluff your way doing these things? Or are you going to come to the end of yourself? Are you going to realize that you are the blind man? Oh, Lord, you're asking a lot. You're asking for the surrender of myself. And here in this passage, I want you to see it because when he's saying that his soul thirsts and his flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land, and that's the land of Australia. Our land is so dry and thirsty. You meet them everywhere. You meet them in, on the pubs and the clubs and the streets everywhere. They're so dry and so thirsty. And where does he go? He goes to look for you, for Yahweh in the sanctuary. I love that. But it didn't hit me until I'm, I'm studying this and, and going through that, that in the sanctuary. See, when Jesus, let, let me rewind this. When Jesus was on the cross, you know one of the statements he cried out on the cross? I thirst. And I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking, Lord, there can't be a coincidence that he cries out, I thirst. Why was he thirsty? It's not just that he was physically thirsty. There's something amazing happening in that cry when he says, I thirst. And, and, and I think it's this. I think when Jesus takes our, your, my sin upon him and he's on the cross and he cries out, I thirst. I think he gets finally what it's like to live under the weight of sin in a dry and barren land. Yeah, yeah thank you. I think he understands that and he cries out as we all cry out, I thirst. And not long after that, he cried out, it is finished. And David, as he's seeing the solution to his thirst, as he's longing for God, what he's crying out for, he's saying, God, the answer's in the sanctuary. It's in the place where you offer your blood. It's in the place where you're on the cross and you cry out, I thirst. That's the answer, God. That's what I need. I need that for me, for my soul, because that's what I'm crying for. And the way to get from this productive spot through the wall to the rest of the Christian life, it's through the surrender of self. That's why it's so hard. It's so brutally hard because, Lord, that's my precious. I've been hanging on to this. And you want it? Oh, Lord, but, you know, you could take anything else, but you can't have that. That's my precious. Oh, precious. And God's like, well, no, I, 
I need that. You need to let go of that. And the wall comes and it hits and it's brutal and it's beautiful. God wants to get rid of pride. He wants to get rid of the the, the self-centered heart. He wants to get rid of the idea in your mind that you think that you can live the Christian life and occasionally turn to God. No, he's saying, if you want to live the Christian life without me, you can do nothing. You've got nothing. Literally, I was with a man this morning on the way here and and we're just talking and we're talking about how our lives have nothing of value. When we strip away our ability to control our mind, all that's left is the rubbish of my life. That's the real me. When I strip away my ability to control, when I strip away my ability to, to, to put on and wear the mask of my Christian experience, All that's left is a part of me that you'd be embarrassed about and I'd be ashamed of. But God looks at that and he goes, wow, it's in the sanctuary, Neil. That's where the answer is. It's it's where the blood would be taken from Jesus when he's thirst. And as it's applied to the altar and as it's applied there on the mercy seat, that's where your answer is. It's in the mercy of God as he looks. And you don't have to cling to what you've got. You can let go of that and you can discover a whole deeper spiritual life. If you haven't been through that wall, then God's going to bring you to that moment again and again and again. And what he wants, he just wants you to let go. Let go of the need for control. Let go of the need to get things just how you want. Let go of the things which you think you have to hang on to because what he wants most of all for you is your freedom. Jesus said that the reason why the Son has come is for freedom. And if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Free from what? Free from the things that would enslave. See, the things that I cling to are the things that enslave me. But when God takes me through that wall and onto the other side, suddenly I see I don't have to have negative centered override when I look at my past. Instead, I can see gloriously every step of the way where where Papa God has been, right? where he's been because every step of the way my father has been there and he's been guiding and leading see here's here's a poem that I wrote on the 8th of August in 2020 what if what if I gave you all of me what if my talents and time hope and dreams aligned with your glorious purpose what if our church was open seven days to touch lives and transform hearts What if our youth were the driving force employed and committed? What if there was a place for every worker in the vineyard of the Lord? What if our church was fully obedient to the call? What great things might it achieve? What lives might be touched and changed, transformed by grace and light and love? Deep calls to deep. Man, the forges, ratchets, the nuts, change the oil, polish the dipstick, give hope a certain sound. Cook up a storm serving so much more than food, modeling excellence and love on the catwalk of life, making music that releases the soul from prison. Set the captive free through the power of art and loving connection. Go wild with adventure, the, the, the sounds of nature. Connect with God on the workshop floor and in the bush and the rumble of motors and the conversations that matters. Just bring all of that. What if, what if we surrendered all? What if I let God take control? What if we drew together and worked as one? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, the thing that drew David forward was this. I have looked for you, he says, in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. And the glory of God is his character. You see what happens when I come to the end of self and I move beyond. On the other side, there is only love of God and love of others. Why? Because God's character is now his glory is being made manifest in my life. And he goes on and he says this. To see your power and glory because your loving kindness is better than life. 
That word for loving kindness is the, is the covenantal word hesed. Now, I'm not saying it properly. If I was a, a proper Hebrew scholar, you'd get a guttural sound there, and you'd be, you know, throwing it almost like you're coughing it up. But at the heart of this word is just this thought. God wants, you know, God, God's faithfulness, what he's after most. He's not, he's not the cosmic wowser who limits. He's the cosmic God who releases. He's not the God who wants to suck away your fun, but he's the God who brings you great joy and peace. He's not the God who would want to strip you of, 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 of your things just so that you could be poor, but he's the God who, who takes those so that you can truly understand what richness is all about. And to quote this beautiful line from the, the um, Alice in Wonderland, Johnny Depp version, you know, it's not a particularly sanctified movie, but I love this moment in it where Johnny Depp plays the character and he says to Alice with a cheeky grin, he says, oh, Alice, you're beginning to look a lot more like Alice. I love that. I think that's what's at stake here is when we let go of selfishness and we move beyond and to the other side and surrender to God, God's character is made manifest in my life. And finally, people will go, wow, Neil, I don't know what's happening, but you're looking a lot more like Neil. I don't know what's happening, Cynthia, but I've noticed things happening around your life and you're looking a lot more like Cynthia lately. I love it. God's fruit being made manifest in your life and that's what he wants for you question is are you opening your heart to let him do that in those moments are you resisting are you just content to sit here and be the productive one it's not to say that when you're on the other side that you're not productive but now it's not about you it's about what God wants to do and maybe it maybe that aligns with what you're doing before maybe it doesn't maybe it looks like you mentoring others maybe it looks like you serving in in some new and deeper and more meaningful ways but the thing is There is so much more that God wants. And so often in the church, we stop growing at stage three. It's only just the beginning of the journey. And David understood that when he was thirsty, what he needed to do most of all was to meet God in the sanctuary. The forgiveness, the grace, the gift, the change of life and the change of heart transforms everything. May God bless you as you think on this today.